turn your Bible. If you got your Bible, you got your phone, you got your tablet, you're waiting on the screen, whatever you need. Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4. We're going to dive in tonight to these scriptures. You know, the scriptures are like honey. Like, 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 it's just sweet to eat. It's sweet to eat. When the word is given to you, it's like, it's like sweet. And that's what I pray happens tonight. As, uh, as you're turning to Matthew chapter 4, we're going to have a little bit of fun tonight. Okay, is that all right? Get a little bit crazy. All right, that's okay. All right, well, Jesus, can you come up here? Hey, Amen. Praise God. All right. I want to introduce you to somebody. This is my friend Jesus. He also goes by Tony. And he's awesome. He can do it. He can build anything, man. He can build anything. I think this is like, you're really Jesus. I'm thankful you're here. I'm glad you showed up. All right? You and my wife. Okay. So this is Jesus. And he's going to uh, help me out tonight. He's going to help me preach. Uh, so uh, why don't you just give Jesus a hand clap of praise. He's going to head right over there. Are you in Matthew chapter 4 yet? If you're with me, say uh-huh. If you're not, say oh no. All right, we got honest people. That's all right. Matthew, it's the beginning of the New Testament. Okay, chapter 4. There we go. Verse 18 says this. We're going to start out with a scripture tonight that many people are familiar with, but I want to dive a little bit deeper into it. Verse 18, Matthew chapter 4, And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers... Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother. Scotty, come here. Chris, come here. Can you guys just kind of stand right up there beside Jesus? So this is Simon and and Andrew. Everybody give them a hand clap. Great. They really are brothers. Just a fun fact for you. So Jesus is walking by the Sea of Galilee, and he sees two brothers named Chris and Scotty. And they're casting their net into the sea, for they were fishermen. I know... Chris fishes. I, okay. <laughs> They're fishing. Verse 19, he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. This is where we're getting to tonight. Verse 20, then immediately they left their nets and followed them. Anybody ever heard this scripture? Right? They, immediately they stopped everything that they were doing and they followed him. Right? Let's go on. Verse 20, they immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee. I need a James. Corey. Everybody uh, clap for James. Coach Kid, come here. You're going to be, who who is this? John, his brother. All right, is that cool? James, John, Chris, and Scotty. Okay. Verse 22. Verse 21. Going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, Corey, John, Coach Kid, his brother in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Anybody ever heard this scripture before, right? Heard this passage, right? You heard immediately they just, they saw Jesus. Jesus was calling unto them, hey, come follow me. And they dropped everything. The way that I used to hear this taught was that when Jesus calls you, it's so strong and so powerful that you drop everything that you're doing and you follow him because he's the son of God. But I plan on teaching you something tonight to explain why in that very moment that they didn't question anybody, they didn't ask anybody, they didn't go to their father and say, is this okay? They didn't go and sell their possessions to make sure they had a plan B. They immediately dropped it. And it was because Jesus was a rabbi. You don't hear this taught very often, but Jesus was a rabbi. Being a rabbi in Jesus' time was the greatest job occupation that you could ever have, that you could ever want. It It was the pinnacle. That's what you wanted to be. That's what everyone who was born growing up through uh, the school of learning how to be a rabbi, it's what they wanted to be. It's what they wanted to be. And I'm going to explain this to you. Jesus, Tony, was a rabbi. And in his time, education was the most prized treasure over anything else. To become a rabbi was the highest aim, but it was a long, difficult process. In Israel, as a child, the way of life was like this. From age six-ish to ten... Young boys would begin to memorize scripture. At age 10, they would have the first five books of the Old Testament, also known as the Torah, memorized. Right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, right? Most of our kids probably don't know the first five books of the Bible, what the names of them are. But these kids, by the age of 10, they had all of those five books memorized. They would teach them the first five books because they felt like and they, they, they had it in their heart that that was God's wisdom and that was God's instruction. And by the age of 10, they had the whole five books memorized. That was where that school ended. 
from, the, from there, it would be from ages 10 to 14. And this, uh, at least all of them would start to go through this school called Bet Talmud. This was the next step in the schooling, known as the House of Learning, a.k.a. the best of the best. This schooling was a school of questions and answers. And the students' level of wisdom, knowledge, and understanding was perceived and judged by their ability to answer questions by asking questions themselves using Scripture. I know that's a little bit confusing, but let me explain it to you this way. My son goes to school. He's in the first grade. The teacher teaches him, hey, Cole, two plus two is, and hopefully he answers what? Okay, good. Good job, guys. Hopefully he answers four, right? That's, uh, that's our education model, right? But in, from ages 10 to 14, when these boys were growing up over here, uh, the way that they um, advanced in their wisdom and knowledge and understanding was almost like they were playing a game, right? The teacher, in theory, would come to them and say, hey, what's two plus two? And they would say, oh, well, what's six divided by 14? And the, the, the rabbi would understand their level of knowledge because he would ask them a question about Scripture, and they would ask him a question about Scripture, And he would understand their level of knowledge. He would see how much they actually knew the word because they played games sharing scriptures with one another. This would explain in Luke chapter 2 where Jesus was when his parents lost him. I mean, that's a bad day. Like Mary and Joseph, they lost Jesus. They lost the Savior of the world. I mean, bad day. (laughs) Maybe they should have got one of those like leash backpack things. I don't know. But they left him in the temple. That's bad. I mean, you you know, I, I, I never like lost my kid, but like you lost the Savior. I mean... Yeah, so that three days later, they've, oh, where's Jesus? Like, <laughs> wait, we lost our son, but guess where he was? He was in the temple, right? He was in the synagogue. What was happening there? I'll read it to you. Verse 46 of Luke chapter 2. Now, now so it was that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers. Teacher, rabbis. He was sitting in the midst of them at age 12. Both listening to them. And asking them questions. All who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. This was not because he was the savior of the world. This was because he has the Torah memorized. That was the goal. At age 14, after nine years of studying, the best of the students would have the entire Old Testament memorized at age 14. 14 was very important because this was the age that a boy could approach and a, a rabbi, and asked to, be, ask to become uh, his disciple. Brandon, come here. At age 14, now Brandon's a little bit older than 14. <laughs> but at age 14, it was, very, it was a very important time because he would come over here. Hold on, come here. He would come over here, and he would, you know, they would be doing these questions. You know, he's asking him questions out of Leviticus. He's answering in numbers. And he's like, well, that was good. I'm going to ask you a question out of Psalms. And you're going to be like, well, I got Proverbs for you. And they're going, you know, they're doing this thing. And that he understands that his level of knowledge is in a place where he doesn't have to go back and work at his family's trade. And then he says, may I follow you? And then throughout this interview process, you say, yeah, go grab the rope. Good job. You're doing great. So Brandon has the, old, the whole Old Testament memorized if you ever... Just kidding. Okay. Maybe. I don't know. I don't. But I have Google. Okay. So he, that was a very important stage. If the rabbi thought that they were smart enough, he would agree to an interview. And if the boy was found fitting, the rabbi would say they could be their disciple. At that exact moment, listen to this because it's crucial. At that exact moment, the boy would leave everything, family, home, profession, and follow the rabbi in every moment for the rest of his life. But the rabbis were picky. They couldn't accept someone who they didn't think could make it. Sadly, not many of the boys got their dream. It was normal for a rabbi only to choose one or two disciples at the time. The rest of the boys would be told that they were done learning and needed to go home and learn their family trade. It was estimated that somewhere from six to 700 boys would start the school and maybe one or two would make it. One or two would be found worthy by the rabbi to follow them and, uh, and, and be worthy of following them. Every, every rabbi has a way of living. It's called a yoke. It's their way of living. It's their blueprint for life. When it comes to divorce, right, they would have an answer for that. Well, that's why they would come and question Jesus, right, because they understood him. They saw him as a rabbi, and they would come and they would question him, right? But a, a rabbi would have a yoke, a way of life. 
that people would want to learn about, right? How do they handle divorce? What was their opinion on uh, the Sabbath, right? How, how do they ha- handle, like, what, what's, what's your, what's your uh, uh, way that you handle people washing their hands? I mean, all kinds of questions, right? And they all had to do with the law, right? And they had a yoke. So Jesus, our rabbi, he came to this earth. Did you hear that? I said, our rabbi. He came to this earth to seek and save the lost. And listen, if Jesus, if, if any rabbi came to, to a student who was 14 years old and said, I want you to be my disciple, even at 19, even early 20s, because every disciple that Jesus picked, they had already been told no, that they weren't good enough. That's why you don't see them in a, Jesus didn't go to the synagogue to get his disciples. We'll get more, more to that in a minute. But if Jesus would come to you and ask you to follow him, it would be like the equivalent today, someone coming up to you and knocking on your door, and when you open the door, they would say to you, I'm giving you your dream job, name your hours, and name your salary. That's about the equivalent of what would happen when Jesus would say, come follow me. I think I'd drop everything too. It wasn't because he was the Savior glowing with the dove on his shoulder. It was because he was a rabbi and he had authority. And the disciples, everybody in the village knew it. The disciples definitely knew it because they were following them around. But a fisherman at the age of 19 on the Sea of Galilee thinking that his life is going to be nothing. And then a rabbi shows up and says, hey, come follow me. Listen, Jesus asked his disciples to follow him. The custom was for the disciples to get to a point where they maybe could ask their their rabbi, can I follow you? (laughs) This, This turns the whole game upside down. It's what God does. There's no other God in the history of time or will there ever be who can do what God did by sending his son to die on the cross. He flipped the game. He calls you worthy. You don't work so hard to where you are worthy. He calls you worthy. So that was what Jesus was about, man. He would find the lowest of the low. No offense, guys. I love y'all. He would find the worst of the worst, man. He found fishermen. He found farmers, bankers. Carl, you look like a banker. Come on up here. <laughs> look at this guy. I mean, he, t- he got the roughest, man. I would not mess with this guy. You know what I'm saying? And he would call him to follow. Anthony, Josh, he would call him to follow. He'd call these people. He'd call them out of their jobs, out of their trades. They were all doing what their fathers did because some rabbi, sometime along the way, had already told them that they weren't worthy. Right. Matt, Jesus called them, called them out, man. Do we have 12? Six, seven, eight, not even close. Where's my other three disciples? Raise your hands. Scott, yeah, Joey, there's one. Aaron, that's 11, right? Daniel, hiding back there. What are you doing, man? Get up here. John the Baptist, he's, he's just chilling. He's like, I'm good. I'm, I'm a fisherman. So he, called, he got his 12 together. Listen to this. Luke uh, chapter 6, verse 40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Will be like his teacher. This was a perfect picture of unity at Jesus' time. That he would go into places. He would recognize the anointing on these men. He'd recognize that that they had given up on their callings. They had given up on what they thought they were going to do in life. They had given up and they had taken up the family trade. Some were fishing. Some were banking. Some were tax collectors. But Jesus walked by them and he recognized, hey, you're the one that I want, that I'm calling to follow me because I believe that you can do what I can do, what I am doing. And not only that, I believe that you can do greater things than I've done. So this is, this is what it looked like when he first called all of his disciples. They all dropped everything that they had and they followed him. So Jesus went around and chose men that he thought were capable of living like him and able to spread his yoke to the ends of the earth. Once he had his 12, they would follow him around everywhere he went, doing everything he did. Education was very important to the disciples. We can see this in Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 11 because their eyes were on him. And in Matthew chapter 6 and Luke chapter 11, he was praying. And when he was done praying, he came back and all of them said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Teach us how to pray how you pray. Because we're laying our hands on people and ain't nothing happening. Teach us how to pray. Everywhere that Jesus went, they would go. Everything that Jesus said, they would say. 
Every place that Jesus went, they went. Everything that Jesus did, they did it for, three, for over three years. This was the way that they operated for over three years. And when he prayed, they prayed. When he slept, they slept. When he went to the bathroom, you get the idea. You want to see what a perfect picture of unity looks like? Can we spread out in a little bit straighter line, maybe move closer to one another? Closer. There you go. Everybody grab onto the rope with one hand, please. Now you want to see what a perfect picture of unity looks like. This is Jesus. Everybody remember Tony? Savior of the world. Nice shirt. When he moved, guess what? They moved because they were in one accord. Can you move your arm, please? Come on, Jesus. I know you flipped over tables. Let me help you. Look at that. Drop your arms, gentlemen. Pull it hard. Look at that. You see it? He moves his arm. That's what Matt was praying before service. Thank you for preaching my sermon in five minutes. When he moves, do it again. Look at that. They move. And Chris ain't focused on how uh, Anthony's arm's moving, and Jeff isn't focused on what, what Aaron's doing, what, what, how he's holding onto the rope. They move because he moved. And y'all stay there for me for a second. That's called being in one accord. This is how they operated for three plus years. They went everywhere Jesus went. You want to you find something awesome? Look at, look at where Jesus took the, his disciples whenever he uh, called Simon Peter. Basically hell. <laughs> He took his youth group on a mission trip to hell. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Sign me up. <laughs> Everywhere that he went, they went. They didn't ask questions. Oh, I don't know, Joey, Jesus, I don't think we should go there. They just went. Didn't have a choice. It was an honor to be covered in the dust of your rabbi. They would end every educational session like they would have a class during the day. You're seven years old, whatever. You go to class. You learn the word of God. You memorize it. You get it on the inside of you. And at the end of the day, they would say, may you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. That's how they would end their class. Because it was the highest honor to be, to, to be uh, able to walk where your, disciple, where your rabbi walked. Perfect picture of unity. I hope I'm helping somebody tonight. Luke 6, 17 says this. And he came down with them. And they stood in a level place with a crowd of disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem, from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon. And he came to hear, they came to hear him. And be healed of their diseases, as well as, as those who were tormented with unclean spirits. And they were healed. A whole multitude sought, sought to touch him. For power went out of, him, out of him, and he healed them all. Did you hear that? Amen. They all desired to touch him, and he healed them all. You know what? When we have a picture of unity, do your arms again. When we have a picture of unity like this, people on earth are able to touch heaven because of their unity. Amen. Maybe they couldn't get to Jesus, but I'm coming to Josh. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? I can access Jesus through Josh. Why? Because they're in one accord. Perfect unity. You know, what? you know why I can get Jesus out of Josh? Because he's followed him around for three years doing everything that he's done. This is where it gets good. T that touch person that you touched earlier, touch him again. Say, it's, that's been good, but it's about to get better. Are we ready? This is what I call the great transfer. This is the end of the book of John, the beginning of the book of Acts. You ready? You ready? Remember, three plus years. Everywhere that Jesus went, they went, right? Drop the rope. That's good, good, good job. Drop it. All right, and I'm going to get you a seat, Jesus. Hang on. This is the throne of my heart. Have a seat. Okay. People will get that later. The great transfer. Jesus. In the book of John, chapter 16, he says this. But now I go away to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. Put your hand over your heart and say it was to my advantage. He says, it is to your advantage that I go away. For I do, if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me. Of righteousness because I go to my father and see you no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will speak not of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. 
All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. It was to their advantage that Jesus would leave. Because the Holy Spirit would come when he left. And then, oh. (laughs) John 14, verse 12. Most assuredly, I say to you that he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also in greater works. The needs he will do because I go to my Father. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. And that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, do what we did for the past three years and do it even better. I will pray to the Father and he will give you another helper. That he may abide with you forever. I call it the great transfer. At the end of the book of John, right? They're all having a time. They just walked on water again. It's great. They're all sitting around a campfire and Jesus is like, I'm about to be out. Acts chapter 1, looks at all of them. He says, love you guys. I'm about to be out. I told Tony I was sorry that we didn't have time to hook up the ceiling rig or I actually would have taken him through the ceiling. Okay. He, actually, he goes to heaven. He ascends to heaven. And all the disciples, they all look up. Look up, guys. So, <laughs> good job. Stay looking, stay looking. So they're all looking up. This is Acts chapter 1. It's beautiful. Read it. They're all looking up, and these two, two dudes show up in white, and they're like, uh, guys, quit staring and start doing. Yes, yes, sir. <laughs> so you know what they did? They listened to Jesus because Jesus said, wait here. Because the promise of John chapter 14, John chapter 16, it's coming. Wait here. And it's, listen, I've got to read this to you because listen what they did. It didn't say that when Jesus ascended that they all freaked out and went back to fishing and banking. Acts chapter 1 says, verse 14, they all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with men and women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. They continued to stay in one accord. They didn't freak out when Jesus left because they knew that when he went there, he got here. as evidenced by what comes out of here. He said, you'll be witnesses everywhere you go because I'm here, I'm no longer there. Come on. They're no longer in one accord with Jesus leading the way. They're in one accord because their unity is so tight, so knit, because they, 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 they watched everything that Jesus did. Now, Chris, move your arm. Look, they're going to do the same thing without Jesus there because Jesus is here. This is good. Listen to this. It gets better. (laughs) As if that wasn't good enough that Jesus, the guy that was healing all these people, that was raising the dead, that was opening blind eyes and opening deaf ears, as if it wasn't awesome enough to be led around by him for three years. When he goes, all of that is on the inside of them and more. Guess what? Everybody's sitting in this room. I don't care if you're asleep or into this thing. Everybody's sitting in this room. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you will do greater things than he did. Greater things will you do. Because he went to his father. Jesus. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. You know what happened right before this? Listen, he goes up into heaven. They're all like, okay, let's wait. And then the Holy Spirit came. You know why? Because they were in one mind and one accord. Perfect unity. If they go back to doing whatever they were doing before, if they break apart and do whatever they want to do, the Holy Spirit does not come and the church looks completely different than it does today. But they stayed and they waited for the promise. They stayed in unity. It was not easy because they didn't know who was their leader. They didn't know what was next. They didn't know what the, okay, a promise, the Holy Spirit, fire, what, tongues. They didn't know. But they chose to stay together. They waited for it. And guess what? Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit poured out. Tongues of fire on each one of them. On their mouths and on top of their heads. And everyone in the city looked at them and said, you're drunk. And then... Peter, hold on to the rope, but come, under, come underneath here. Peter looks at the city, and he preaches to them. Yes. We're not drunk as you suppose. These are my brothers. Yeah. Come at me. Look, look at them. I mean, this is, this is a crew right here. I'll go anywhere with these guys. Yeah. So Peter starts preaching. And guess what? 
The other 11, they're not analyzing, wow, Peter's saying, well, why didn't he do three worship songs first? They're in support. Why? Because they're in one accord. Go ahead, Brandon. Go ahead and preach to the 3,000. Go ahead, man of God. Go ahead. It's your turn. It's your turn. Jesus was up there, and he preached. And I know that you saw how he did it. Whenever you step out, you've got everything that he had. So go ahead. 3,000 souls were added because Brandon stepped out and preached. And then the Bible says... And when 3,000 souls were added to the church, two of them dropped the rope and went down to Judea and started First Judean Baptist Church. And then the other two over here, they didn't like that, so they went down to Samaria and started the First Samarian Presbyterian. And then these guys, they're like, well, we don't know what to do, so let's be Republicans. Okay, well, they're going to do that. Let's get over here and we'll be Democrats. Does the Bible say that? No. 3,000 souls were added that day. What'd they do the next day? I'll tell you. I'm glad you asked. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers, verse 45, and they sold, or 40, yeah, five, they sold their possessions and goods and divided among all as anyone had need. So 46, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity and heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. They didn't let him leaving break them up. It empowered them. They remembered that Jesus said, this will actually be to your advantage. My God, it gets better. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. The multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. That's what I want, man. Corey prayed it before church. If you weren't here, I want the church to have one heart and one soul. I want the church to have one heartbeat. And I want that heartbeat to match the heartbeat of our Father. That's all I want. I don't care about the names on the doors. I don't care about how long revival went for you. I don't, I don't care about that. I care. Is your heartbeat lined up with your rabbis? They had one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of these things they possessed was his own. They had, things, they had all things in common. With great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all, nor was there anything among them, uh, anyone among them who lacked for all who were possessors of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that they sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as they had need. Listen to this. This is where it gets really good. This is the promise that Jesus gave in John chapter 14, Acts chapter 4, verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 5, verse 12. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. That they were all, and they were all in one accord on Solomon's porch. The perfect picture of unity is that when Jesus left, he didn't really leave. He just moved. He was able to be here because the Holy Spirit was now their leader, their God. But the Holy Spirit, he's not at the front of the rope. The Holy Spirit is here. He's here. He's here. He's here. He's here. Right? But listen. Verse 14 or 13. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but they, uh, the people esteemed them highly. They recognized their anointing. Verse 14, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord. I love that. Did you hear that? Believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Because, got your arms, because of this, the souls were added to the Lord, not to the church. Their apostleship, their discipleship wasn't growing. Look at, look at our numbers. I, um, Numbers should not define you. I, don't, I, I honestly wouldn't care if three people showed up tonight. I don't care. My, my success, listen, my success is not found in numbers. My success is found in obedience. Yeah. I will preach that until he comes back. I don't care. Jesus went across the sea to minute. He had a, a, um, a mission trip, right? Yeah. An evangelistic outreach. He went over there, took all of his disciples, got all of his investments, took boats. They got over there, and one person showed up. Guess what his name was? Legion. They got across the sea, and Jesus saw that Legion was there, and they're like, well, you know, we were expecting more, so let's just go back. 
No. What'd they do? They delivered Legion. What'd Legion do? He went and preached. He went and evangelized. He grabbed the rope. Not about numbers. Sick of it. Not about numbers. Not about numbers. God doesn't look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. He'd rather have 10 burning than 400 lukewarm. Come on, I know, I know this is hard, but I'm telling you that God cares more about 10 who are burning. It's not elitism. Okay, it's not about, well, look at what those 10 are doing right, and what are the other 390 doing wrong? No, it's about the 10 burning, and maybe some of the 390 will join in because the 10 aren't worried about what the 390 are doing. They're worried about what the rabbi's doing. I told you, my heart was racing. My heart's getting better. I hope that you get Cleopas all over you at Luke chapter 14. Did not our hearts burn within us? And go home talking about this. Where am I? Okay. We need each other. Where God is calling us to go, we cannot go alone. Amen? Now let me tell you quickly, 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 five things, five things that break unity. Are you ready? If you want to write them down, that's great, because I'm going to move quick. Five things that, that break unity, right? Because at the end of the book of Acts, this is what we're left with, right? This is what we're left with. We're left with the perfect sign of unity, right? They were all in one mind and one accord. That's what we're left with, right? So my question tonight is, why doesn't the church look like this? Why doesn't the church look like this? Five things. Number one. Disunity happens. Unity breaks up when we take our eyes off of our rabbi. When we, when we take our eyes off of Jesus and his perfect theology, which is this word. If you ever need to start a church, just this, this is it. If you ever need to go somewhere and preach the gospel, this is it. If you ever need to go somewhere and lay hands on the sick and see him recover, this is your blueprint. Don't visit websites. Don't go and look at pamphlets. I hate that word and I just said it. Don't go do all that. Get into the word. When they take their eyes off of Jesus, they, they get discombobulated. You know, Chris starts doing his own thing, right? He's, he's just over here and, and Scotty's looking over there and, and, you know, Corey's sitting down or I don't know. I don't know. They're all doing their own thing. And this is what the church looks like today. This is where denominations come from. This is where the f first uh, evangelical, fundamental, independent church of Chris comes from. It's because he started looking here and stopped looking there. We can't do that. Whenever we take our eyes off of Jesus and his perfect theology, unity or disunity happens, right? Second thing, pride, stubbornness. It's my way and my way only. I'm right. I'm going to conduct a little experiment here. You ready? Just bear with me. Now, pride is a problem, okay? Whenever you think that you're right and you're going to do it your way and nobody else's way, it's a problem. It breaks up unity like crazy. So I'm going to conduct a little experiment with my disciples here. You guys ready? Okay, one, two, three. Okay, this is what the church looks like today. Keep, I mean, I told you to do something, Carl. I'm telling you, there. See, that's why I'm telling Carl, look at him, red-faced. Carl knows that God told him to go that way. But, but these guys, God told them to sit down. This is why the world looks at us and they laugh. Okay, you're good, you're good. This is why the world looks at us and they're like, it's a joke. It's a joke. They believe this and they believe that and they're going this way and they say this is over and the, the, the signs of the, uh, the, the, the spirit, gifts of the Spirit are done and they're extinguished. The world has no idea what we believe because we're all going in different directions. My question to you tonight, you ready for this question? My question to you tonight 
is that how many people have we sacrificed at the altar of being right? I'm just going to give you a second to let that set in. How many people have left the faith? How many people have walked away from Jesus because of our beating of the chest desire to, this is right, this is, this is it, this is right. When you decide that my way is the only way, that I'm going to do it my way, you drop the rope. Or you fight on until you have no breath left pulling on that rope and you, you, you pass away. You're, you die spiritually because you get burnt out. No one else is going my way. No one else is voting like me. No one else believes what I believe. All this stuff, it's all because of pride. Where we're going, where God has called us to go, pride can't go with us. Third thing, doubt. Doubt is the initial um, way that Satan tempted man. He came to man and he said, listen, did God really say? Look at that tree, man. Look at that fruit. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be better than anything you ever had in your life. Yeah, but Jesus said, you know, God said, I can't have that. Can't do that. Can't do that. Not going to do that. I'm going to go over here. And he comes up into your ear. Did God really say that? Doubt. Genesis chapter 1 right there. Doubt came in. Eh, maybe he didn't say that. Eve, what do you think? Snake, what do you think? Not good. It's, it's, it's going away from God's plan because of doubt. Doubt will shred unity quicker than you can spell doubt. Did God really call me to this rope? Did God really call me to this? God, did you really tell me to do this? So many people, double-minded. God calls them to do something two years later, complete, not even close to what God called them to. Right? Number four, you ready? Entitlement. Entitlement. I'm going to hit this one. Titles themselves are not a bad thing. Their act, titles are actually structured into the DNA of heaven. It's Ephesians 4.11. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. It's not a bad thing to have a title, but the problem comes when the title has you. The, the problem steps into these 12 when they're out ministering and all their hearts are set on Jesus and the Lord comes to Corey and he says, I, they're, they're, this person right here on the street, I need you to evangelize to them. And instead of stepping out, he looks down the line, well, we need an evangelist. It's a problem, man. It's a problem. A sense of entitlement. God didn't call me to that. God didn't call me to serve in the nursery. God didn't call me to manage the parking lot. God didn't call, he called me to preach. You won't get close to a pulpit with an attitude like that. You shouldn't. Entitlement is killing us. It's killing our unity. Listen to this. Unity is broken when your calling becomes more important than the one who called you. Whew. I mean, are we awake? Is it too long? What's going on? Unity is broken when your calling gets higher than the one who called you. Sadly, one of the reasons that we're in the shape that we're in right now in our church and in our country is because Jesus is saying, pick up your cross and follow me to a generation that's grown up having everything handed to them. Get mad if you want. That's fine. Whatever. Okay. I'm sorry you didn't get a trophy. Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me. And you're like, oh, all right, where is it? See people out there riding. See people out there doing this thing. They're all mad. You know, never this, never that. They're all doing all this stuff. They're, all, they're, all, they're used to having everything handed to them. They're not, they're not used to working for anything. These guys, my, those three years for them, the, those three years with Jesus, it was not easy. All of them at some point in time left. All of them at some point in time walked away from Jesus. All of them. Not one of them stayed the whole time. It got hard. But it wasn't John the Beloved saying, you know, well, I'm, I'm the Beloved. i got to sit in Jesus' lap and, you know, you guys go evangelize. I'm going to stay here. That wasn't it. Entitlement will break this group up faster than you can say entitlement. Right? Last one. The spirit of offense. Matthew 24.10 says, in the last days, many, which is the Greek word for all, will be offended. In the last days, everybody's going to be offended. Hello. Have you been on Facebook in the last 24 hours? 
can you believe who you know, they voted for? And I can't believe who's the president. And I can't believe that you're shopping over there. I can't believe you've got Starbucks drinks. You know what they believe in? Okay, get quiet. It's all right. Everybody's offended, man. <laughs> and we can't get anything done because everybody's offended. That's not how these guys operated. They didn't stand there and say, well, you, you know, look at Scotty. Oh, he's wearing jeans on stage. You know, I'm so offended. I'm not going to follow him. <laughs> we do that in our own lives. We break unity because we're offended. We quit. And you know what? Whenever we're offended, guess what? We isolate. Do you think God's called us to isolation? You think God has time to go to everybody and, okay, when I raise my arm, you raise your arm. Okay, when I raise my arm, you raise. No, he does it, and then they do it because they are not offended. You know what a sign of a mature person is? You ready? A sign of a mature person is being able to have disagreements with someone and not be offended. We actually need that. We actually need diversity. It's called the body. If we had armpits for knees, we'd be in bad shape. Right? When everybody's offended, man. Everybody's offended. I'm, I'm going to tell, tell you this just for a second. I'm going to tell you this. Listen, you, we cannot afford to go where we're going. We cannot afford to be offended. Let it roll off, man. They, Jesus even told him. He said, hey, guys, we're going to go into these places, and some of these cities aren't going to accept us. You know what we're going to do? We're going to go in there and preach the word, and if they don't accept us, guess what? We're going to walk out of that city, and we're going to wipe off the dust. We're going to shake it off. They didn't want it. That's cool. We'll shake it off. We're not offended. We're not going to just stop and pity and party and do all this, that, and the other. We're not going to do that. We're going to go where God's called us to go. We're not going to be offended. I'm going to shop at Target. You know why? I don't agree with what they're doing with their bathrooms, right? I don't, care. I don't, I don't agree with that. I'm not going to sign the petition that says I'm not going to shop at Target because there's lost people in Target. I know three people agree with me tonight, but I don't care. Listen, there's darkness in the world. There is darkness in the world. And because I accepted what he did for me on the cross, I am light. I'm not nervous about what happens in Target. And I'm not going to go in there and let my daughter use the bathroom with some man. I'm not going to do that. But I am going to go in there and I'm going to be light. If Jesus operated the way that we did, if he went on there and signed NeverTarget.com, if he went and did that, he would have never been in Matthew's house, eating and drinking with the sinners. A friend of the sinners. He would have never been there. Mm -mm, nope, nope, I'm going to stay over here with Carl. I like Carl. I'm, me and Carl forever. But if we don't go into the darkness, if we don't go into the darkness, no one's going to see light. No one's going to see light. You are light. You've got the heartbeat of heaven on the inside of you. God has called us to unity. God has called us to unity. And if you don't believe me, let me finish with this. Pastor Mitchell said that at the end of every sermon, there should be a so what. So what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? We're not going to be offended. We're not going to have doubt. Where we're going, we can't have doubt. Where we're going, we cannot have pride in our heart. Where we're going, we've got to keep our eyes fixed and focused on Jesus. We won't be able to do it alone. God has called us to do it together. 1 Corinthians 1.10, I appeal to you, everybody in this room, in the name of Lord Jesus Christ, that, you, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and there be no divisions among you, but that you will be perfectly united in mind and thoughts. Uh, Colossians 3, 13 and 14, bear with each other, forgive each other. If any of you have any grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And uh, above all these virtues put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. You know why they're able to stay in unity? Because this is love. This is love. Love, 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 love. No hate. It's okay to have an opinion. It's okay to have a preference, but it's not okay to hate. They're able to operate in unity because they have love in their hearts. It's what binds them together. It's what shows this world who you are. It's what shows you that when you have love, when you put on love in the morning, when you wake up and you put on love, that, that the world sees you and they're like, what is that dust? What, what, what's different about you? I just, I just told you basically that I hate you. Why are you loving me? It's because they've chosen to hold the rope. John 17, 23, I and them, this is Jesus talking, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought together in complete unity. Jesus' desire is unity, not the Tower of Babel unity where it was all about them. 
the type of unity where it's all about him. Then the world will know that you, that you sent me and that you have loved them even as you have loved me. Psalm 133, 1, we've all heard it, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. First Peter 3, 8, finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Don't be afraid to be wrong. Don't be afraid to be wrong. Show compassion. Listen to one another. Talk it out, man. Don't get on the Facebook and comment down there below on your little keyboard wars. It's a dangerous thing, man. It's a dangerous thing. You've got to choose to be silent when an opportunity for argument comes. Listen, listen. There's not been anybody that has lost an argument and said, you know what? Thank you. I'm going to follow Jesus now. It doesn't happen. Instead, get out from behind the keyboard. Go to that person. Say, hey, would you like to have coffee? Would you like to have lunch with me? Sit up underneath that table and work it out. And don't live broadcast it. That's not what it's about. It's about you and that person, man. That's what we've lost in this society. We've lost that table. That conversation. What do we do to fix our communities? What do we do to bring back hope? What do we do to make America great again? Get, in the, get under the table and have conversations with people who disagree with you. Love them. Love them un- un- unconditionally. Last one, Ephesians 4, 3. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Every effort. As much as it has to do with you, keep peace. Do everything in your power before you go and slander that person, before you go and tell them how wrong they are, before you go and and blast them on Facebook or whatever, before you go and do that, make every effort to keep peace. Stand up to your feet. So what are we going to do about it? What are we going to do about it? Two things. One, I don't know if there's anybody in this room, but there may be somebody in this room that doesn't know Jesus Christ. And here's what I want to tell you. Here's what I want to tell you. That the world has told you that you're not good enough. The world has said that you, you, you can't make it. Go back and do, do whatever you do. You're, you're not good enough. You're not worthy. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus is walking by you tonight. end. Jesus is walking by you tonight. And he sees that you feel hurt. He sees that you feel lonely. He sees that you feel unaccepted. He, he, he sees into your heart and he sees that no one's ever accepted you. And he's saying to you tonight, come follow me. Come follow me. Come follow me. You'll never have to worry about that stuff ever again. I see you worthy. I see you holy. I see you righteous. You are worth it. Son, daughter of God, you are worth it. And you know what he does? He walks by your life, and he's doing it tonight. He walks by your life. And he says, come and follow me. Come and be my disciple. I see you worthy. You know what? I'm choosing you tonight. November 13th, 2016, I'm choosing you tonight because I believe that you have what it takes to go out into the world and share my way of life. I'm choosing you. God chooses you. God chooses you. You don't choose him. God is choosing you tonight. So if that's you tonight, Jesus is calling and he says, come grab the rope. Come grab the rope. Don't be afraid. Don't be timid. Don't worry about what the world is saying. Don't worry about what the world has said about you. Don't worry about that guy that you thought you found all of your value in. Don't worry about what that guy said about you. You come and grab the rope. You come and grab the rope. And you be bold tonight. You come and grab the rope. Jesus calls you worthy. Jesus looks in your situation. He doesn't see the mess. He sees the miracle. And guess what? He sees the ministry. This altar call is twofold tonight. If you've got anything on the inside of your heart against your brother, against your sister, something on the inside of you is saying, you know what, I want to be here. I want to grab this rope. But I've been double-minded. 
I've picked the rope up. I've set it down. I've picked the rope up. I've set it down. I'm tired of it. Jesus is calling you tonight to pick it up. To pick it up. Where we're going, where God has called us to go, we can't go alone. We need each other. And you need to say yes to what God is calling you to tonight. You need to say, I've got a yes in my heart that can change this nation. I've got a yes in my heart that can change my neighborhood. I've got a yes in my heart that can change my family. I've got a yes in my heart and I'm gonna grab the rope. Come on, come on, come grab it. Come grab it, we're gonna pray for you. Come grab it. Come on, it's the best decision that you'll ever make. Come either to be saved or come to say, you know what, I am gonna be unified with, my, with this body. I'm gonna be unified with this body. I know we're gonna go through some crap. I know we're gonna go through some stuff. I know we're gonna go through some stuff, but I've got a yes in my heart tonight. I've got a yes. Come grab onto this thing if that's you. Don't be afraid. Nobody's gonna judge you. There's nobody judging here tonight. Nobody's judging. You want to make a difference. Get a yes in your heart. And understand that Jesus lives there now. Jesus is on the inside of me. He calls me worthy. I've got everything that Jesus had and more on the inside of me. And guess what? Monday I'm going to tell somebody about it. I'm going to pray over these people. If you want to make that decision in your own heart, in your own seat, that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. But tonight, let's get a yes in our heart. Let's get a yes in our heart. Let's be a people that's going to say, yeah, Pastor Darren, where you're going, I'm going to support you, man of God. If you've got a vision of three to 5,000 people, I'm ready to go to work. I'm ready to go to work. I'm not going to look around for Jesus and where is he at in all this? He's here. I've got a yes in my heart. I want to see a difference in St. Albans. I want to see a difference in my community. I want to see a difference in this world. God, right now, God, I thank you. God, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for a yes in their heart. I thank you for a yes in our heart, God, that will change history, God. I thank you, Lord, for everyone holding on to this rope. Lord, for those who have made a decision to say yes in their heart, who are staying in their seat, perfectly fine. But God, I thank you for the yes in our heart. God, right now I pray, Lord, that anyone who has come forward for salvation, God, I know that you know their heart. I know that you see right into their mess, God. I pray that you would come into their situation and that you would change it, God. Lord, that you would show them that you called them, that you brought them to the kingdom for such a time as this. But God, right now, I grab onto this rope and I say that there's a yes in my heart. I believe for every brother and sister that's grabbed onto this. I believe for everybody who's got a yes in their heart. And I say I'll go with them. I'm not going to stand back and tell them what they should and shouldn't do. I'm going to lead. I'm going to go where you tell me to go, Jesus. And Lord, I'm going to be humble. I'm going to be uh, not afraid of making mistakes, God. I'm going to say yes in my heart. And I'm going to hold the rope. So God, I pray everyone in this room right now would see that you desire for us to be unified, God. You desire to see us healed, God. God, I pray right now that as I grab onto this rope, there are people that are holding onto this rope with me that we will see the dead raised. We will see blind eyes open. We will see deaf ears open. We will see legs grow back. I've got, I, my, my dreams are bigger than my memories. And I thank you, God, that you've called me to link up with other people on this rope. On, I, that you've called me to link up with their dreams. God, and that we will see you move. We will see heaven touch earth. God, I thank you that you've given me power in my hands to lay my hands on the sick and they will recover. God, I thank you that you've given me words on the inside. Come on, pray this for yourself. God, I thank you that you've given me words on the inside of me. God, that are life and not death, Lord. I thank you that you give me words to speak to this, this world and to see things change. God, let this be a marking moment in our church, God, that from this moment forward that we won't worry about how everyone else is holding the rope. We won't worry about how everyone else is doing, God. We will focus, Lord, on moving forward together toward you, for you. That we'll keep our eyes fixed upon you. That we will move pride from our hearts on a daily basis. That we will work at this. And God, that we will rest in your promise. That we have everything that we need. And more living on the inside of us because we have a yes 
in our spirit. We've got a yes in our spirit, and I'm not going to let go of the rope. I'm not going to let go of the rope. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your word, God. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Come on, just praise him from your own lips. Come on, out of your belly, praise him right now. Just praise him and thank him. Thank him that he's called you to unity. Come on, you can pray. It's okay. The only wrong way to pray is not to. Come on, pray from your own heart. Don't worry about the person beside you. Don't worry about the person beside you. Praise him. God, we praise you, Lord. We thank 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 you, Jesus, for putting a yes in our hearts. God, that feels so good. I don't have to fret. I don't have to worry because Monday I'm going to have a yes. Tuesday I'm going to have a yes. And if there's a day of the week that I feel like I don't have a yes, that I know that there's at least 100 people on the other end of the rope to say, yeah, I remember that night. Yeah, you do have a yes. Though a righteous man falls seven times, he stands up eight. Father, I thank you for tonight. We glorify you, Jesus. We thank you that we're leaving this room different than we came in. We thank you that we've got a word in our heart. We've got a yes in our heart, God. I thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I hope you got what you came for tonight. God loves you. Listen, he is for you. He is not against you. He is for you. He's got, he's got plans for you that you have no idea about. He's got things lined up even this week that you had no idea were coming. He loves you. Don't ever forget that. Amen. Can we just give the Lord a hand clap of praise? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Here you are dismissed. Go tonight. Loving your brother, loving your sister. Tell somebody about what happened tonight. Don't drop the rope, okay? I mean, you can drop the rope. Don't drop it in your spirit. Don't let go of that yes. Amen? Thank you, Jesus.